Right, everybody, welcome back to the Legit Crypto Lounge. We're going to do things a little bit differently today. Um, normally, obviously, you're here for, for AMAs with projects, but we thought we'd do something a little bit more special for you this time. We've got a couple of legends in the space. We've got Crypto Batman and we've got David Hunter, who are both going to be taking us through some tips and tricks on what to look out for when it comes to contracts, um, Basically, you know, trying to spot scams, um, what to look out for, what what is a good contract and what is a really bad, bad contract. So um, I don't know yeah. how we how we want to run this today. I think um, it'd be good to be led by you guys uh, more than anything, if that's okay, in terms of your experience and, and what you look out for. And then we can, um, you know, have a couple examples go through those and, and pick out some key key things is there anything you want to uh, add toby yeah well we start with a simple simple uh stuff like how you actually access a contract and how you can how you can view it and then we can we can go into the functions and stuff like that so might be an idea to have a look at growbat maybe block star contracts you guys can talk us about the functions you've got there um anything that we've kind of should be looking out for um yeah, and then we'll let, let you guys lead the way. Um, we'll hand over to you. If you want to just give a bit, bit of an introduction to yourself, just a brief one, just to say about your experience in the space, uh, how long you've been here now, because we know how long David's been here. <laughs> I've been here for a minute, buddy, for a minute. <laughs> uh, I don't know, Crypto Batman, would you like to go first? You want me to just kind of kick things off? I think it's really important as we're going, going through this too, just real quick. Um, to really ex explain kind of the, the sentiment, because not all contracts are, are exploits depending on the function and stuff. So I think it's really important we look at a couple of different contracts and kind of look at the space as a whole when it comes to contracts, what's possible, what's not possible currently, and the technology behind them, and then go through maybe explain some of the functions. Because a lot of smart contracts um, have its place outside of the crypto space as well. I know that's what a lot of you guys care about. But talking about technology and where the future of contracts are going to, I think it's really important to understand what contracts can and cannot do as well. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, basically, basically uh, in a nutshell, a smart contract is something that uh, it's, a, it's a logic layer. Um, it's, it's something that defines logic in an Ethereum virtual machine and other virtual machines um, with different blockchains. And it's a set of instructions that are adhered to um, whenever a transaction is made or a call is made, and the, I mean, to give you a base contract, I'm going to I'm going to share my screen now, Toby, if that's okay, mate. Of course, mate. Yeah, go for it, brother. Hold on, two seconds. Right. So I created this contract just while you were talking. Um, this is a very simple contract. I, I I created it and I uploaded it. Um, so we have a compiler. If you if you can see that, um, you can actually see it now on the on the VSC scan. If any of your like on a computer, the the, con the contract address there, and I'll drop it in chat. Let me just uh, let me just pull up the chat. Um, so yeah, I, I created this literally a couple of seconds before the chat started, and this is a very very simple um, idea of a contract. It's got a storage variable, it's got a getter, and it's got a setter. Okay, um, so if you if you're looking at the screen, um, basically you you can go and you can read and write this contract. Um, it's a simple contract. It stores a string called welcome string. That's a variable name uh, of type string. And it, it's assigned high from the blockchain, right? Um, it's got a get string function and it's got a set string function. So we have um, fields and we have, you know, uh, methods that we use to do these kind of things. Um, so the, the get string is very simple. Um, it's got a modifier that's public that, that um, or a, a viewer that's public that, that tells you that anyone can view this. Uh, it's a view only, so it doesn't modify the chain, and it returns a string. And this is the name of the string that it returns. And then whenever you call that by clicking read contract, um, you'll be able to read that, um, reset. And you see, get string, get a new string. So I've, I've already set that. And we can write it, um, let a mask, okay. And we can set this to, I uh, just set the string. 
just set the string. I can write that. I can change the blockchain data. Um, once that transaction completes, that will change the value held by this welcome string string um, into what I've just set. So get string, uh, reset. Let me just see if that's transacted. It has uh, get string should now should now update. Ah, fuck me, idiot. Why is it doing that? Um, let me just uh, get string. Remix has shown it correctly. BSC scan is not. Very strange. Yeah, there you go. It's, it's changed now. So it changed to what I just said, what I just wrote in there. So that's that's an example of a, a very simple contract that um, has a state variable called welcome string. Um, we can view it with this um, with this tag, and then we can set it and write it with with this. Um, we're changing state in there, so that costs gas. We're reading it here. It doesn't cost gas. It doesn't cost any gas. Anyone can read it. Um, anyone can set this. If you want to go and play, you can set the string, and then you can go and read it in this um, at, at, at this address. Um, you can you can actually go and play with it all you like. Um, it's available to anyone, but um, yeah, it's going to cost you a bit of gas. And I think that's you know that in a nutshell, um, playing with this and going to this address. Uh, and being able to read and write this contract and understand what that code does is um, is a very powerful thing in itself. It's a very basic thing that anyone can do, but it's the it's the most basic thing that you need to do when you need to go and check the code or check any other contract. Does that right. make sense? And that really sets the, the basis of what a smart contract does and, and does not do. As uh, Crypto Batman has showed you guys, now this contract is limited to that specific function, the way it was written. Um, I, I mean, we can get into proxies and upgradables and stuff like that to be able to change these things in real time. Uh, but for the for the most part, this is a set constraint of what this contract can do and what it cannot do, right? So this can't obviously do something beyond what it was originally intended to do because it's an immutable contract. That's right. It's 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 all contracts beyond the proxies and, and transparent upgradables are completely immutable. When they're on the blockchain, you cannot change it. You can change the data held as long as you're as long as you're able to change that data if you're if you're allowed to. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you cannot change how the logic works in this contract. You have to rebuild it if you want to change the logic and then redeploy. You can't. It's, if all contracts are immutable unless they're transparently upgradable. But that's a whole different topic for a whole different day. Right. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to try to keep it if possible and everything. I think everybody will probably agree with that. Kind of keep it to the simple basic contracts, which you would normally see in a yeah. token contract. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few contracts out there that are tokens that are upgradable, um, that are proxies and everything. And, but I do think that maybe we can do like a, a V2 of this or like a second series to kind of go through that and what they actually mean and how they're upgradable. But for you guys that were looking at the contract that he was doing as well, so on that write function, typically on a token, you're not going to have the, the capability of writing to that function. So as you guys seen in Remix, he added the ability to basically log into that contract from Web3 because it has the insertion of the Web3 so you can click uh, connect. So if you want to just uh, open that up and just show it that at the top there where you did the um, insertion of the yep. Web3. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, smart it's, it's up here. yeah. So what he's doing is he's basically just injecting a way to be able to use Web3 and connect with the wallet to be able to change that. In a typical smart contract that's deployed by a development team or something, you as a general user will be able to see everything on the read function. You'll be able to see the write functions, but you won't be able to change anything. So you won't be able to write to it like you're able to do in the test one that he put out, just so you guys are aware. So that's that's kind of a security thing so that nobody's just going and writing. And that changes with internal and, and external returns as well and being able to connect to those contracts. Yeah, that's right. You've got a thing called visibility specifiers, um, where it's public, private, anything else. And, and that determines what you can and can't see and can and can't change as well. Um, uh, let me let me go through Growback, for instance. Um, <clears throat> almost every token contract, and I'm saying almost every contract, they, they pretty much all do. Every token contract will adhere to a standard called ERC-20, which has been adopted by Binance, and they call it BEP-20. BEP-20 is a standard that all tokens uh, on a lot of these blockchains need to um, need to adhere to. 
and, and it's a set of rules basically and, and, a, and a public facing interface that, that you get to use and it has a sp specific set of, of, um, of things that you need. This is, a, this is the interface, it's called a public facing interface, I bet 20. So you must have a function called total supply. It must be external and it's view only and it must return a you. So this is a, a basically a set of things, a set of rules that you must adhere to in your contract um, to become IDEP 20 or ERC 20 compatible, right? So it's got total supply, decimals, symbol, name, get owner, balance of, address account. So that's where you get your balance from. That's transfer is how you transfer. Um, allowance is how, what, if, when you approve someone else to spend your token, um, this, this allowance is what they can, they, they check against to see if they're allowed to spend it. Um, you have approve, which allows you to approve someone else to spend it, which updates this, um, this allowance variable, by the way. And then transfer from, uh, you must emit transfer events and you must emit approval events, right? So this is the standard contract. So you could actually like take that IDEP 20, you have to then um, put your logic in to all of these functions um, and, and override them basically uh, and interface um, to be able to, um, to, to be able to be BEP or ERC 20 compliant. Um, this is the router, let's close that, dividend distributor, that's uh, it's nine, I pre-sale airdrop, manual dividend distributor, grow back. So, my contract called Growback is IBEP20. It, it fulfills the IBEP20 interface. So it's got all the functions that it needs. It's got everything that it needs um, to be IBEP20 compatible. So that's that's these things after this is. So you've got the contract name, then what it what it what it uh, adheres to, uh, implements in interfaces, or if it overrides any other contract. Um, that's a wee bit deep, but yeah. So as we've seen in this IBEP 20, um, IBEP 20, it's got total supply, right? So if we go down here, we should see control F, total, total supply. Um, swap threshold, total supply, let's go down. Where is it, return it? Total supply. There you go. No more token, total supplies here. So this is inside my contract and it, it overrides the, the implementation and it returns total supply. It returns something in there. So it gives you, that satisfies the, the BEP20 kind of um, uh, interface. Um, and a lot of these things, decimal symbol, names, get owner, and they're all returning basically part of the logic up here um, of, you know, total supply is that. Um, name, symbol, decimals, it, it's all in there. So you're basically returning something you're storing to to be able to um, satisfy the the constraints of that interface. I'm, I'm on track, David, yes? Yep, you are. I'm just looking at Mark's face and he's confused already. I can tell by the look on his face. He's like, what, is, what does all this mean? I don't, I don't, I don't yeah. see it. But no, yeah. No. No, no, I'm following along, but I have got a, a, a quick question in that um, you mentioned ERC20 and, um, and, and BEP20. Um, if, yeah. you know, if you've got another token on another blockchain, is it a simple case of just changing that to whatever the blockchain is and it filters through the same? No. What, this, no. Uh, it, God, it, it's what I was no. going to say. Every single uh, token contract that is on the Ethereum blockchain can be duplicated over to the BSC network. And the, the reason why, like even in a lot of contracts that I do, Batman goes the extra step and changes it to the IBEP 20 and everything. It can literally literally still say E because it works on yeah, the same working chain. It, it, it doesn't matter, yeah. right? It's basically de depends on what chain it's deployed on. So in this case, he's That's using true. Remix. I could take the same contract without changing anything in it for the most part and go ahead and go deploy it on the Ethereum chain as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's yeah right. you, um, I'm just going like to say you, that you, you you can see quite a lot of fork contracts from Ethereum to BSC, yeah, can't you? Yeah, where yeah. people have all they've done is just copy the contract from uh, an ETH token and replicated it onto to BSC. Right, but yeah. to be fair, the reason that's capable of doing that is because Binance literally is a fork of the Ethereum network anyway, it so it uses a yeah. lot of the same constraints. 
that's uh, yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, there are some differences you have to change between um, between Ethereum and and the Binance Smart Chain or the Binance Chain or whatever the fuck they want to call it now. Um, and it's that's all to do with logic level things. Um, so the, the instead of using the pancake swap router, you would be using the Uniswap router or any other swap um, based router on on Ethereum. So there are small changes like the the native wrapped token, for instance. Um, the WBNB here um, is OXBB4, but wrapped ETH is going to be a different different I, e, ERC20 type token. So yeah, there there are changes you need to make. But if you don't need to know these addresses or, or and the root address, you can just create a, a bog standard ERC20 token like that just operates exactly like an ERC20 token. And you can put it on both blockchains at the same time without any changes at all. As long as the the the, the chain is Ethereum virtual machine compatible, um, the, everything translates. Everything translates. You can put it on Polygon. You can put it on fuck me uh, Pulse chain, whatever the fuck he's going to call it. Um, any, any Ethereum virtual machine compatible Avalanche, for instance, CRO, they'll, they'll all work the exact same way. So yeah, the only thing that you're, the only thing that you're changing is the where in this case, like he had on the screen where it says the rep uh, BNB, you would use the Matic address in place of this. That way, exactly. it's interacting with that, and then change over to that router as well. That's right. Yeah. Are so there any contract, blockchains? Are there that? any blockchains that have um, actually created their own system? You know. Yeah. Uh, fuck. Um, Ada, for instance, Cardano, Solana. Uh, it uses Rust. Um, they do have uh, this the same kind of standard, but with a whole different language uh, and a whole different way of writing things. Uh, to to translate an ERC twenty contract into Rust is a, is a hell of a job, and they do have right. cross compilers though. Um, but yeah, it's like Solana, Cardano, you know, we all know how they go. Um, Solana's pretty, it's pretty solid in terms of its, um, its virtual machine. Cardano, not so much. Um, but yeah, uh, for now, I think you just stick to, um, stick to Solidity and, uh, EVM compatibles. It's a lot easier for everyone. And at the end of the day, that's, that's the playground we're in right now. Um, if you, if you want to get into Solana or anything else, you can, you can get somebody else in here because I hear it. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I, 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 gonna, I was just going to say I am not the one. I am not the one. So yeah, I'm not Neil. Um, on, on, Solidity is going to be here for the next ten, twenty years until some other new technology. But I think there's going to be a lot of technology built using Solidity and using the chains the way that they are now. I mean, uh, as you guys know, with the ETH upgrade and everything, they're not going where it's going to continue to be this. And all the new developers that are in school and learning, and some of us old guys that have been here for a while. That that is what we know. That's what we're going to continue to develop new technology on as well. So, um, yeah, mm, I, I'm not a fan of Solana. It's nothing against that project or anything. Um, a lot of the logic doesn't make sense to me why they're doing it that way, um, and that's why I've never developed on it. So, yeah, it's um, it's, a, it's Rust is um, it's garbage. Sorry, excuse my French. <laughs> Can't stand it. Can't stand um, it. What about yeah. what about what about Substrate? Which what what? Sub 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 yes. Oh, that's um. Is it? And there's there's another one. Uh, what's what's the Python? Um, David, what's the Python um compiler for for EDM? Somebody mentioned it in here the other day. I've never used it. I can't stand Python either. Um, yeah, I don't use it either, buddy. Uh, I haven't used Python called? in Hold on. in years. No, yeah. Python, Python. If you're going to use Python, um, you might as well use C plus plus and just Python do it. Compiler no for EDM. Pi EVM, um, but there's no, there's an actual. Yeah, there's another one. I don't remember the name of it now. I can't, I can't remember one. the name. But there was a. I heard um, Python Solidity compiler. No, I, I don't know. I don't. I can't remember what it's called. Um, somebody. I, I was in a an AMA, and somebody said that there was a female developer. I think it was in here. I'm sure it was in here. Um, that they mentioned this thing, and I can't for the life of me remember what it was called. But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna bother too much about it. Uh, but if you are Python centric, there are things out there where you can write smart contracts in Python. Um, so it's, it's honestly knowing JavaScript, which is Solidity is basically JavaScript with a few limit a lot of limitations because of the way the blockchain operates, the way that it's, it's it has finality, um, it has it's transactional. So you, you know you you can't do loops, you, and you've got to be very gas gas sensitive about these kind of things. But if you're into right. Python, there's definitely Python compilers. That will compile down into EVM compatible bytecode. 
on that note as well, if any of you guys are looking to become developers in the future or you're looking to go to school, I have a ton of guys ask me all the time, what language do I go learn right now? If you're getting into the space right now and you're looking for one language to learn, I would recommend learning Solidity because a lot of that is backwards compatible to JavaScript and all of that stuff as well. It's what plus plus. So if you're looking to get into this world and you're wanting to become a developer, that is what I recommend learning. Go ahead and learn Solidity first and then work backwards because a lot of it's going to cross over. Yeah, yeah, a friend um, of mine told me that the best thing is just to be a main developer. After main developer, I can think of going into front end and back end. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, it. Honestly, JavaScript. If you're already a JavaScript developer, um, if you're already a web developer, and you're, you're kind of comfortable with like Node.js, it, it translates poof, straight in. You know, it's it's like the, the the way you declare variables is different, um, but you know, it's it's not hard. It's strongly typed, and it, it you have to provide a you know, a, a kind of a, a visibility specifier, and the way you do that is kind of different. Normally, it's like you know, 256, swap threshold public in, in like C sharp or any other language, but this way it kind of it's 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 our about face. It's the uh, it's the type, the visibility, and then the the name in in, in Solidity. So it's kind of like here, unit 256. That's the type. It's a, it's an integer, 256 bit integer, and it's public, and it's and that's and that's a variable called swap threshold. That you can go in and see. Um, you can read contract, and you can go down here, and you can look for a swap threshold, wherever the fuck it is. Um, where is it? Uh, swap threshold. Swap threshold here, and it will tell you exactly the number. Um, what the blockchain doesn't like is floating point numbers or decimals. It doesn't like decimal points, right? And this is why you always use an integer and then multiply it by the amount of decimals. So if, if you look in the code here, um, it's, you know, uh, let me see, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? Total supply. So it's 1 times 10 to the 15 times 10 to the amount of decimals. So that's adding 18 decimals onto the end of everything. If you cannot do floating point math on Ethereum virtual machine, it's impossible. This is, this exactly. is what we're talking about limitations. This is what we're talking about limitations. So everything has to be um, everything has to be an integer. And then what you do is when you have it off chain and you've called that data, you then turn it into a human readable number um, by either you know using the web three libraries, um, you know web three dot utils dot from y or to y, and that will convert it into a floating point number. Um, and that's but that's like front end and that's DAP development rather than contract development. You just have to understand that you cannot use floating points or decimals in a in a smart contract. Right. Uh, just so you guys know, so we're not boring you guys and putting you guys to sleep with a lot of this terminology because some of the stuff you guys will never, ever possibly use in your life because some of you just don't care about the development or then you just want to be able to read the, the contracts and everything. But to uh, Batman's point about um, using un Unit 256 where it's adding 18 decimals. So if you're going and you're looking at it from a read standpoint, you may want to know, like, what's the max total supply and everything. Typically, you will see that depending on how the contract's written, but you would see it um, basically written out as, let's say, that the max transaction is 1 million. You would have it written out as 1 million and then plus 18 zeros after that. So if you see that, don't get scared that the max amount is that high. You have to make sure that you're taking off those 18 zeros, and that would be the true actual 18. Or there is a converter and everything, ETH converter, where you can put that in there, and it'll tell you exactly how many it is as well. Um, but I think a lot of this discussion up to this point may be a little rich for some of you guys or a little much for you guys to, to quite understand. I think a lot of you guys really want to understand, you know, when I'm looking at a contract, what is out there, what should I be on the lookout for, right? Well, the answer is there's a lot, right? And some things mean different things than other because a lot of you guys have asked me, well, if it has a blacklist, should I not invest in it? Well, I'm not a financial advisor, neither is Batman or Toby or, or Mark either. No. But there is a purpose sometimes to have that, that blacklist because as soon as somebody starts front running or doing that, you guys, how come there's no blacklist? How come we can't get rid of that contract that's doing all the front running? How come we can't do this? Well, you said you didn't want a blacklister, right? So we got to figure out different logics to be able to get rid of that stuff. Um, so sure. not always, right, is the answer. So there is a time and place for pretty much any function that you can write. It's basically how it's used, right? And it really comes yeah. down to who has sure. control of the contract and who controls the contract and is able to process things. Same thing with a mint function. There's a time and a place for a mint function, right? But it all yeah. comes down to who has control of that mint function, right? So if you want to go, uh, that's yeah, there's a unit converter.
So if you guys are wanting to that, you can just do a Google search of um, unit converter and you can be able to put in for way or whatever and it will give yeah. you the information <laughs> that you want to be able to see. You can actually click on the big number in BSC. So if max TX amount is that massive number, you're like, holy fuck, that's like way higher than the actual supply. And you click on it. Um, you go down here to BNB. Uh, it's and uh, basically you read that as the the growback, and so that it, it's that many it's that many growback tokens, right? So that's the big number you see, the big scary number, and then this is a number in token that it pertains to um, for the for the for the layman. Right, listen, I'm going to um, just make a, a point here as well. I mean, in this space, you get a lot of people calling themselves dev, don't you? Right, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a contract dev. Sometimes the way it's portrayed is they're actually the, the project. But you're kind of led down the path of believing they're a, a dev, that they've wrote the contract. There's not a lot of people that do, and the ones that do that can't do it normally mess something up, you know, struck, struck <laughs> transactions and stuff like that. Um, but a, a lot of the time, it, the, the, the contract developer is outsourced or they're even using the pre-made contracts on pink sale and stuff like that, which is basically an already defined contract. You write in the values of certain things and then it mints does the contract for you and then you become the owner of that contract. That doesn't really make you a dev in my opinion. Anybody could do that. No, it doesn't. Are you saying yeah. if you know how to copy and paste, you can't be a developer? Yeah, I certainly <laughs> am, mate. What is, but, what is yeah. it's almost, almost 90% of what I do is copy paste in, in this, because why, why would you, why would you, re, unless you've got some custom logic you need to in, like implement, if you, yeah. I understand all this and I still copy and paste. I still copy parts of things. Yeah. Because why, why reinvent the wheel? You know, this is why we fork things. A lot of developers fork them, then modify them. Um, yep. it's, it's the modification bit that's, that's the hard bit. And there's literally, I mean, everything's a DEP20 contract with custom logic. And so you fork the DEP20, you add your logic, off you go. <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's understanding <laughs> what that logic implementation is going to do that, that, that can really screw you up hard, you know. Right. So under, yeah. somebody had to write so, the first time, but there's no sense in reinventing the will if something already exists, right? Um, but from a developer standpoint, you can't just go out there, a real developer standpoint, you can't just go out there and, and copy and paste just because you say, oh, well, that's the function I need. You need to make sure that the logic works and make sure that it's not an exploitable uh, contract. There's been so many exploits in the space over the the last several years, and it's just simple rookie mistakes, I would call them, because they don't take the time. They say, oh, well, here's the function I need. I'll just plug this in, and yeah, this is it. They watch some YouTube video and say, oh, perfect, I'm done, <laughs> and, and that's not the case. So everything has to, to work together. Um, so yeah, I personally, I even do a lot of copy and paste, but a lot of the copy and paste are from contracts that I've already written are contracts that I've yeah. already put together. That way I know that those contracts are good, that are legit, and I don't have to go worry about anything but just updating some of the logic behind it. I have a whole folder of nothing but smart contracts that are labeled correctly so I can go pull those those different functions or the um, unique stuff that I'm trying to do in a new contract instead of having to reinvent the wheel all the time. Yeah, like, I think that's, that's a good point, though, because, I mean, you're copy and pasting your own work and stuff you understand, but there's people out there that copy and paste the contracts and they include functions in their own contracts that they don't even know they had because they don't know the understanding of it. There's some people who will say, wow, I just fought the contract. I didn't know there was a mint function. Like, you know, you've you got to be careful with that. Brings me back to the other point, David, about you saying about blacklisting. Like, be care that, that blacklisting can be a good function, I think, because you can use it to stop someone who's hacked wallet, stop them from selling tokens. You could stop it from somebody who's exploited the contract. But in the wrong hands, it's also very dangerous. So, you know, if, if someone's got a blacklisted function in the contract, ideally, to me, they should be doxxed. You know, you, you're looking for somebody who you can fully trust yeah. to use that function properly, not just some random who's, you know, could use it willy-nilly on whatever they like. Um, well, I think I think I, th I think the biggest um, uh, they call it blacklist. Um, it can be it can look like anything. It, it, instead of being called blacklist, it can be right. It can be called team anything. Tokens, team addresses, team addresses, or anything else, and you can actually use that to lock your team tokens, so they can't spend them, but they still get rewards. If you understand where they come from, so yeah. so basically that the, the same type of um, anti function, I, I, or an, an, an anti, yeah, I, I cut a scam function can be used for good. It's just, like you said, if you're doxxed 
and you're, if you've got something like that, you know, you, you need to be fucking legit. You know, and, yeah. you know, well, uh, yeah, let's, it's a bit nuts. Let's, let's mention that thing that happened the other day, Batman. Someone managed to blacklist their own LP. <laughs> um, what was talking was brilliant. that to? Um... <laughs> oh, no. um, it was uh, it, it was the one that's... that told me to shut the fuck up. Um, it, it yeah, was, yeah, um... I recall. <laughs> <laughs> what was the name again? Astro, uh, Astro, 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 yeah, Astro, Astro, Astro X. X. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, they blacklisted their own LP, uh, and then their dev disappeared, deleted his Telegram. Um, I it already screwed up another contract previous to that that I knew about. Well, I, um, let me tell you, let me tell you how that worked, right? And how how they actually did it. And I, I spotted it in the contract, right? So what they had was in this um, in the transfer, right? So let me see, transfer from in here. Um, if you can't trade. Um, you need to require something, something, something. If sender's not equals owner and recipient's not equals owner, right? So if it's not launched and the pairs of recipient require, what they had was an anti-snipe function in, and that anti-snipe, they caught the LP edition as uh, as a sniper, right? <laughs> 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 and the con- <laughs> con- <laughs> yeah, it's <sort> of- <laughs> and uh, they, 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 they basically blacklisted the fucking uh, blacklisted the LP pair. It was it was fucking stupid. But the, and I, they, I they didn't. They didn't I can understand. They didn't have a, I can understand. No, I, I can, they, they didn't have a whiteness function. They didn't. Yeah. yeah. It was fucking dopey, man. Oh Jesus Christ! So Sorry, I, I, guess... it, I came in. I was, I was speaking so to them. They had them, no and I said, way to remove from blacklist either. Then they had no, no function. No. No. Hundred um, and eighty B and B blacklisted. Lost. Lost. So, so yeah. um, my recommendation, if you're going to create a blacklist function, you should have a remove blacklist function as well in your contract. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I came in and said to them, I said, look, by the way, I, I'm, I'm going to touch on your contract in a minute. And he went, no, shut up. You've spoken too long. I'm speaking now. And I just went, okay, all right. And then um, one of the guys texted me. He says, you, you've got a problem with the contract? I went, no, no, it's fine. Go ahead, lunch. <laughs> yeah, Fuck you're me. absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Wait. Yeah, you're not going to fucking miss I remember that they, they had said the, the DM due. <laughs> yeah. It was so yeah, funny that, that. that night. Yeah. Everybody always wants yeah, help after the fact. After the fact, they yeah, always want help, do. don't they, Batman? Yeah. That's it, mate. That's but, it. But that, that, that kind of leads to another conversation about um, night mechanisms. Because. You know, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of thought in this space about you know whether people should be doing that, whether they should be technically you know stealing people, or whether it is actually good for the space. Um, but a lot of night functions have things in like blacklists, don't they? And you know stuff like that after so many blocks. Um, right. Uh, just real quick, before you get too far into that, just to touch back on what we were just talking about, because I think it's important. Um, with blacklist functions and all that stuff and all these different functions, I think it's really important to understand and, and you know, people calling themselves dev, to Toby's point, uh, are developers that aren't really developers. They go have a third-party company. They create all these things, and they say, here you go. They just turn it over. Their job is done. They don't really care what you do or even if you understand how to use the contract. And simple mistakes are made because people don't know how to use the contract because they're not the ones that develop the contract or they don't understand enough about it, but they want to be known as the developer, and then, but they don't understand how to read and write their own contracts and everything that were, because they're not the ones that developed it. So I would look into – if I was going to be looking at a contract – beyond just what the contract says, I would want to know who is the one that's actually controlling that contract. I've seen many projects that say, oh, we have our own contract, it's unique, it's this and that. Great, do you know how it works? And they don't, right? Because they're not the ones that create it. So I think that's very, very important when you're looking at contracts that maybe have a blacklist function or a mint function and all those things. There could be a purpose for it, but make sure that the person that's in control of that contract understands why they're there and how they work and what their intended use was for them. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a hundred percent correct. I mean, uh, and then you've also you've also got the, the the idea that somebody else wrote your contract and has has inserted malicious code in there. So if you do become a project dev and you do get somebody to create your contract for you, always give it to somebody you know that knows Solidity to check it for any malicious code that that dev can put in there. They can slide in little wallets and ah, there's there's many many ways they can they can siphon off from your volume. Um, that you need to watch out for. 
I just so, on that point, Batman. Um, it, do, do you think that there's a time and a place for every function that you can create within a contract, or are there? Because obviously we've listed now blacklist functions, and there's other elements that can be maliciously used, but also have a, a time and a place as well. Are there any, you know, elements, any coding uh, structures that? are just malicious you know is there certain yeah. things that we can look out for in that respect uh, uh fucking hell right so what i've what i've seen recently are modifiers being completely and utterly like like absolutely abused um so a modifier is something that let me see this ownership thing where's it where's uh off, contract off um a modifier only owner right this is something that you put in in the into the the text, and it's it's a require function. Require is owner message sender. So this mod, this restricts access to any function to the owner, right? And that's what it does. I've seen this used, and it's called you know is safe or whatever. And what it does is it checks if the sender is the marketing wallet, and if it is, it adds you know a couple of hundred thousand million tokens and um, a couple of billion tokens to their address and drains the LP. It's so so right. modifiers aren't all bad, but they can they can be mis, they can be misused, you know. Um, at the end of the day, there's there's a time and a place for every function, um, but with the with the incorrect logic, it can become malicious. Right. Uh, just to touch on that real quick, Mark. Um, so the the core of the function or the simplicity of all functions are not nefarious by nature, right? It's basically. Like uh, Crypto Batman said, with the modifiers and all that stuff that are put on place that change the logic of what they do, right? But in a simplest form, um, even outside of crypto, if you're trying to do inventory and all that stuff, and now you need to be able to create modifiers, there's a time and a place, and the functions themselves are not illicit, right? It's basically how they're used within that same contract or the person that is creating the logic behind them. But in their simplest form, individually, they are not malicious. Mm -hmm. So let's um, just talk about hidden functions because it is possible to hide functions, right? Um, I would say it's not. I would just say it's, it's not hide, right? Because obviously anybody can go through there and read unless they haven't uploaded and verified the contract, right? Where yep. you're able to go through and read everything. For, so from that simple standpoint, right? And I'm trying to keep this really simple so that the everyday average listener understands um, a lot of these terminology, because again, I know a lot of you guys don't care about the code itself. They just want to know, well, how does this affect me? But from that standpoint alone, it's not that you can hide it, right? And if there is one that's not verified, you probably shouldn't be investing in it anyway, right? But you yeah. can go through and pretty much view and read the contract as its intended use um, case is, but everybody's not going to understand what the modifiers are and what to look look at. Yeah. yeah. So, but it is it's a, every every function that's written in the code should be viewable in read contract, right? If even if it's not, you no, know, write contract are for functions. Read contract are for view only functions. Write contract are for anything that modifies any variable inside and modifies the state of the blockchain, right? Um, yeah. Basically, even for the for the for the malicious person to use it, it has to be external. It cannot be internal. You cannot call an internal function from outside. So you can't hide it. Per se, the, the function will be there. You can hide and ob obfuscate the code behind it, it, like by not verifying or by obfuscating and making it so complex that nobody fucking like nobody with a you know without a degree in software engineering would it would ever look, like look at it and read at it. I mean, I've seen I've seen some shit named and and just like A B C D blah 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 and, and weird like X X Xs and stuff in, in a lot of these scams and it's 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 there to obfuscate. So they're not hiding; they're just they're just making it so complex that you know the the, the average person will never understand what's going on. That's what they do. Um, yeah, just kind of hide it amongst other stuff. Yeah. So exactly. I have this kind of question: Is it possible to write a code in the contract in a way that if it is not read well, you think it does one thing, 
while in actuality it does something else. <laughs> Welcome to my life, mate. That's called that's called uh, that's called debugging. <laughs> right. I, there's many functions I've written that don't do the fuck what they're meant to be doing, but this is why you test. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, what I mean is you make it like a, a way in which a dev may try to scam. Um, or log pull a contract in which he writes it in a way that it seems to be working properly, but he does it in a way that it does a malicious action. But when you read it, yeah, you may yeah. not actually notice it. Of course, of course. There's, there's, I'll just there's touch on that a little bit. I'll let you pick up, Batman. That's so on the read side of it and everything, you can have it to where it reads out different things, but on the right side, you'll notice that they don't necessarily match in numbers and everything, and they can change the name of certain things, but it still needs to follow the same logic. But I have seen it to where you can change um, the right side to where it's different to read it. It just gets confusing. So, yeah, you can yeah. change the name of the way that the functions are and everything and what they're called, and they can be malicious in that way, too. Yeah, that's right. So instead of so this one could be, you know, you could have two functions, set fees and set F-E-E-E-S. And it's only the set E-E-E-S that sets the higher fees. And, and there's a set of logic in there. For as this one, you, you, read, you read liquidity fee, reflection fee, marketing fee, dev fee, charity fee, blah, blah, blah. But they could have hidden variables that you need to read the code for that are settable by a different set fees function. So what you read as the fees, you, you understand to be the fees. But there's actually another set of fees hidden, hidden in the code that you don't see that are the true fees that they can change um, to, to either stop anyone else selling or whatever whatever they need to do. So, yeah, there, there are ways that nefarious actors um, can obfuscate things to your detriment and to their gain. It's, it's, it's never straightforward. Thank you. So, guys, can I um, – I'm just going to – take you back a little bit um so f firstly guys to get to a contract all you gotta do is go to bsc scan and copy and paste right. the contract to bsc scan and then it's going to pop up like what batman's got on the screen right now um it's going to pop up the, like this yep and then click into the contract and, code, and it you can see the you code got the, so yeah you got the code and the then, read and the write um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you something in, in a bit with our contract, um, which will, might be quite cool. But let's. So, what, what, what's everyone looking for when they're looking for a, a, a verified contract? We're looking here for this green tick, right? The course, the, the the contract source code is verified. Yeah, and it's exact match. Um, obviously, if, you know if that's that's good. But then you should also be able to see the code. Uh, in an unverified contract, there'll be none of this. You won't be able to see this, this, or this. Um, the, the, the code, the lead contract, or the right contract, you will not be able to see that because there's no matching ABI. Um, um, so, yeah, basically, if you can see the code, it's 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 a good indicator that they're, they're not trying to be nefarious, um, for starters. So that's that's checkbox one. Um, this is verified. They're not, they're not openly trying to hide anything. Um, the next step is basically to get some understanding um, of, of how... Uh, an, a standard debt 20 code works right uh, a standard debt 20 um contract works so like i said before you've got a transfer function so you look at the transfer function um or is it sort of a bit of a bit transfer uh, transfer from um so this is the transfer function this is the base function anyone will be using to transfer anything um what pancakes what uses is this transfer from function um, because it, it uses a different contract. You have to approve your token, blah, blah, blah. So transfer from uh, sender recipient amount. That's how you put, that's how pancakes what will call that function. And it checks your allowances um, because the sender might not, might not be you. It might be somebody you have to allow. Um, then you need to check it and then you need to take those allowances off, right? And then it, it calls a different function, which will have your, you know, which generally has your transfer logic in it. This is where you start taking taxes. This is where you start checking if, if like for different things, this is your business logic in a transfer. Um, and a transfer is the most basic form of, like, this is how you trade, right? So this is probably the most important function above, like, above allowances that um, that you need to be looking for. So it's, it's generally this underscore transfer from. Again, they can call that anything they want, but it's generally, um, what happened there? 
something, something weird happened. My, my telegram went all tits up. Um, so yeah, this transfer from, the transfer will point to transfer from, uh, transfer from will point to, you know, transfer from, and that, that's, that's the one function where your business logic, um, resides. So basically, if you can't trade, this is says if you can't trade, require the senders of the owner or senders of pre sale contract. So basically, it, it allows the owner or the pre sale contract or whoever you want to allow to be able to send their tokens to liquidity or anything else. So it's, it's, this transfer from is probably the most important function to look at. This is where most of your, most if not all of your nefarious code will hide. Understood? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Right. Top of the background. Yeah. And then also if it's possible or not too. But if you guys notice in green there where it says can't hold more than, uh, than max hold dude, sorry. So anytime that you guys see these things pop up and everything, that is where it pulls from. It's not just some random thing that pops up it, when you're trading and everything. Same thing when you get exceeds amount or not going to go through and everything. All these um, error codes or whatever that you're getting are populated from the contract. That's right. Yeah. Um, a, re a require a require is if, if this um, this logic is not satisfied, if it's false, the, the EVM will send you an error with this message. If it's true, it's fine. It'll just carry on and it'll it will continue down the rest of the code. So requires are um, are a base um, access requirement and a logical requirement um, to to satisfy a set of conditions. Um, and it's it's how we it's how we control program flow and uh, how we control who can who can't and sa to, to satisfy specific logical conditions that we want in our in our um, in our business logic. Right. You see, if one plus one is it goes to the next step. If one plus one shows three, then it would pop up an arrow like this. That's how working through the contract. That's right, yeah. It, you do get some that don't have a message like this. Um, oh, I've, I've commented it, but I, that was a mistake on my part. I didn't I didn't send a message, so I'll just say uh, there's been an error. Whatever. Cool. Let's um, just, just, just mention something about um, renouncing contracts. Um Oh, I have a in, bad in opinion the, about this. It's not probably. <laughs> I don't like it. Oh, but I, so I, I, I mean, never it's, 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 So when when someone renounces a contract, it basically means that they have no more control over the functions. They can't. Not, they have not, no idea what they were not, doing from the beginning, and they're scared they might mess up, and they decide to renounce it. <laughs> yeah. but not entirely. It, it doesn't actually mean that, right? Um, in the old type contracts, there was an only owner modifier. And when they renounced it, the owner was a zero address and they couldn't, they then couldn't change the state of any variable that had the, the only owner modifier. But what we have now and what other people are using are the auth, the authorizations. So, um, so you can, you can now renounce a contract and still control the contract. So renouncing is, is basically fucking out the window. Um, the, the whole idea, you used to be able to renounce it and then you couldn't change anything, which mean, which meant if it was safe, it's, it's safe after that. Um, but with these authorizations, um, you can renounce a contract and still still change state variables. When he said it's, it's safe after that, it's safe until it's not, right? And then you need to be able to go yeah, back. Exactly, and, yeah. And you don't have the ability to because it's renounced, which is why I never recommend yeah. that. But, but you're right. It, and today, renouncing is not renouncing like it was uh, three years ago, right? A lot of those no, things are no. and now that you have the proxies, which, again, we can say for another time, being able to upgrade, even those you can show renounce on that contract and still be accessed by the proxy. That's right. Um, yeah, now we have is authorized. And then so we, we can authorize ourselves, um, renounce the contract, and then just check for authorization rather than um, – and it, that allows however many people you've authorized to come and change things. That's actually a more powerful thing than just having the owner. Because if you lose access to your owner wallet, um, you, the contract's basically dead in the water. Then you, there's no changes you can do. There's fucking nothing. And if somebody else gains access to your wallet, um, with the authorization method, you can add and remove authorizations. So you can have your two wallets that you've got you've got access to. So if you do lose one or lose access to one or one gets hacked, the other one can remove that authorization and carry on as normal. It's a it's a, it's a big development in the safety of these smart contracts. But yeah, renouncing awesome. bullshit. Yeah, um, it's, like I say, I mean, anyone who renounces renounces a contract is 
have or not is not a good thing <laughs> to me. Yeah, no, no. Um, well, let me give me a, a, a little better example and everything. I, I know we're kind of getting pressed on time here. I know there's lots of everybody wants to go over, but on renouncing a contract and everything, look at what happened or even not being able to upgrade a contract it, or even being able to change a router. Look what happened when everybody went from V1 to V2. Look how many contracts didn't have the ability to do that. And they literally had to relaunch their entire projects and they are not the same projects they are today that they were back then. Right. Mm -hmm. And then also you have to worry about when you go from a V1 to V2, because you don't have the ability to go in and start changing these things is that everybody thinks, Oh, we're just going to launch and it's going to be a new router and everything in there. It's going to be a V2 on pancake swap. And then the whole code is different and it goes to shit because the same people that were involved that built the first one may not necessarily still be involved today. And I've seen this happen over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, well, I've, just talk about a couple more functions, I guess, um, that could be quite dangerous. Um, the pause part, like you can be called anything, it. can't they? So, yeah. yeah. Say that again, David. I mean, this, this is it. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I, was, I was just going to say the pause function is probably a big one too. Having the ability to pause a contract. Again, functions have their time and their place and everything. In my general rule of thumb, I try to leave out the pause function out of all the contracts that I write because I think it's just a bad look for contracts. And I don't think anybody should have the ability to, to pause trading, period. Mm -hmm. And then there's a couple more really, isn't there? Minting and airdrops. Uh, it could be yeah. I don't necessarily know that I disagree with the mint function. Again, there's a time and a place. Um, obviously, I'm working with a project that that is still trigger uh, got that trigger in their mind when they start talking about the mint function. But there is a time and a place for a mint function. Yeah. It's just not in most contracts, right? Uh, it yeah. really depends on what the logic is and what the the full potential of that to become, right? But I think it's just worth touching what it actually means. Um, I mean, because well, look at. Um, Look at Cake, for example. That's one of the biggest projects with uh, a mint function in the contract. Um, yeah. You know, and, and they are obviously they're using it because of um, the emissions that are created by uh, staking and stuff like that, and the way they've got things set up. So it's actually a funny one, Cake. So, the, like, I, I'm going to get into a bit of a, a side thing here, but I mean, they, they paint themselves as all these burns that they keep doing. But the reality of it is, is their emissions, so the tokens that they're, emit, they're minting are higher than the tokens that they're burning. Um, so it's actually an inflationary token for the time being. I mean, they're looking to change it and they have, they have been doing a few things. But yeah, so there, like, like David says, there is, a, there is a valid use of the mint function. Um, yeah. At, at, at the same time, like, you don't have to mint your entire supply. When you when you create the token, you can you can mint you know twenty percent and then say you know and add that to liquidity and then mint another ten percent and, and make that available for people and then you as long as you're, you you have a set max supply uh, and you don't mint past that in, in a standard you know degen or whatever you've got to look that that mint isn't detrimental to the price and um, so yeah you can you can release more and more tokens as time goes on um, it, it's yeah there's definitely a time and a place for mint but I I, I tend to stay away from it. Um, yeah. especially anything that, that, that is already released, what they say is their max supply of tokens. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm from the same uh, camp as that. If you're going to basically have a supply and everything, just set your total supply and go ahead and pull it out. You can always lock them up. That's why we have lockers and all that yeah, stuff exactly, as well. Exactly. Um, again, there is a place for that. It's not in your general contracts for tokens. And just to be clear, you do not need a mint function to bridge between chains. I've heard that over and over and over and over again. You never need a mint function. That was old technology years ago. You do not need a mint function to go between chains, to be very clear. Yeah, you don't. Just have a, so, you have a so, score on both, both things. I have a yeah, question on, I, ha I have a question on the mint. And um, let me start with the mint. So for a project now, which does pre-sale, and gets out 70% of the token, then say they have 30% left. How does it get into market without minting? 
How do they get it into um, the collision without minting? You're right. So you, you they, right. So basically, when you create your token, um, it, it mints the entire supply to the owner generally. That's the general consensus, and that's how like everyone kind of does it. Um, it's not always how it's done, but so you then whitelist from taxes the the pre-sale address, and you send those tokens to the pre-sale address, and you hold the other thirty percent. So when they sell out, um, you basically take some of that money and you add those thirty percent into the pancake swap pair, and you create that liquidity pool. And then you put some money in with that because the liquidity pool and the is, is a balance, right? So your thirty percent plus thirty percent worth of your pre-sale that gives you the equal price. So yeah, it's managed by the, the the owner, the contract owner, or the token holder. Whoever can add liquidity, that's how it gets into the general market. Um, it's airdropped to everyone else from the pre-sale token uh, from the pre-sale contract. But yeah, the, the token itself is added to the liquidity. It can, it can be added to liquidity by the pre-sale contract as well, because it can just interact with the router and, and add liquidity, do whatever it does. It can be automatic, it can be manual, but yeah, they get, they get into the general market by adding liquidity into that liquidity pool. Okay, thank you. That really explains a lot. And the second question was on the topic, topic before here, uh, renouncing of um, contract. I had asked one question one time and someone had called me a fool. So the thing really got me vexed. So when you yeah. say now, um, owners don't really renounce wallet advert, is it that what they do is when they say they have renounced the wallet, the um, contract address, they just whitelist some wallet addresses that can... Uh, no, some, no, um, no. no, no, no. Uh, re yeah, renouncing renouncing is dead. It, renouncing doesn't really happen anymore. Um, if, if they if they say they're renouncing, um, look, look deeply look into the contract because they're gonna have a, they're gonna have an exit strategy um, so, because they're obviously not giving a fuck about it long term. Let, let's just talk about what they what they mean by renouncing a contract, just to break it down. So when someone renounces a contract, they're basically sending the contract to, from the owner to. Uh, a dead address, right, or OXXX. Right, uh, they're giving out right. rights to be able to use the right function of the contract. Typically, what, 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 okay. so what, they, what, what really... you're... So how, how do they how do they control the functions from there out? Is it because they've already set it so that they, the owner can still have privileges over the certain no, no, functions? No, no, no. So contract? once uh, the no. way it's supposed to work when it is renounced is that you lose control of the right function, right? You, you no longer, it needs yes. to be set yeah, however yeah, you're going sure, to yeah. have it, and then you're done, right? There, there is no more changing it, so it better be good whenever you do do it. Um, but it gives it to the, like he's typing there, to only owner would be the address. So if there is a dead address out there, nobody can yeah. obviously access that and connect Web3 because it has the Web3 injection to it. There are other ways to do it as well that, that aren't done through Web3 connection, which Batman can touch on if he wants to and remix if he still has it up. Um, there, but there are other ways to access contracts. But nobody's renouncing contracts anymore. And if they, if they're smart or not, and I'll tell you why, because the people that are buying into those contracts are also buying into the people that built the contracts as well. If it is the developer yeah. doing it, so how do you buy into a contract? But then all of a sudden, two months later, you want me to renounce it because it looks good for for whatever reason, right? Well, you trusted me to build it, but now you want me to renounce it because you don't have, think I ha don't have faith in me to continue to to make sure that it stays updated and then also uh, being able to avoid exploits. One of the number one things because of all these renounced contracts, sorry about that, um, the renounced contracts is because of the fact that now they don't have ability to be able to combat exploits that are new coming into the space as well. For, so for all you guys that are out there looking at these odds and saying, oh, well, it says centralization because of the contract and all that stuff, hey, is it renounced, you should renounce it. That is the opposite of what you should do. The only making notations of it from the audit company, which again, you guys know that I'm a co-founder of another audit company as well. The only reason we put that in there is so that we make people aware of what it is. It doesn't change anything. Mm -hmm. So now you said they don't, they don't do that real renouncement anymore. What do they do now? This current day and time, what is actually done when they see they have renouncement? Right, so if, if they say they've renounced it, it means they, you know, right now, um, as an owner, I can I can authorize different people to access these these modified, so set distributor function. Only people that I've authorized can can set that distributor. Right. Um, basically, if I renounce my ownership now, I can never authorize anyone else to do this. Um, so, you know, if I lose access to that wallet. 
I'm fucked. I'm, I'm basically fucked. The contract's fucked. The whole thing's fucked in case I need to make any changes. So renouncing something is basically, if they, if they say I've renounced this contract, it's basically telling you that they don't give a fuck about it. Um, they, you know, renouncing used to be, it's renounced, yeah, they can't fuck around with taxes, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's, that's pure DGM, pure fucking DGM. Nobody with an ounce of fucking dignity and integrity in their in their life is going to renounce something that they care about. Fucking not a chance. Okay. If in a nutshell... We lost you then, buddy, I think. Um, oh, 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 I actually muted myself. I um, <laughs> I said, if, let me try to get you. What I mean is like, what you're trying to say is, if... A, um, normally, a project, can, a contract can be assessed by anyone once it's uploaded. But when a team says they have renounced it, they are limiting the number of people who can access it to just a few people. No, 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 no. You're you're limiting the amount. The, you're limiting yourself to not be able to change any important variables. That's all. Everyone else can still access it, um, but you're limiting the, the the amount you can control in the contract. So if you could change taxes as an owner. And you've announced you then cannot change taxes anymore. Um, if you could change, okay, you know, I get it. exactly. That, that's that's all you're doing, buddy. That's all you're doing. Ah, thank you very much. All okay. right, guys. Just just a a quick one. Um, I've pinned an announcement in the text chat. Uh, if you reply to that, I'll enter you into an NFT giveaway. And what I'll do with that is I will I'll show you how we go into the contract, and I'm going to show you how I'm in an NFT to your wallet. So enter to that. I'll put you all in a duck race um, and we'll, we'll go on BSC and I'll show you how that's done. Um, and just tell me real quick. So, yeah, go on, buddy. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I know a lot of people are, are are really curious about this and I think it's a really great topic that should be covered more inside the crypto space. And I've tried to kept, keep everything general uh, as a rule of thumb, just so it's understandable from the everyday person that's new into crypto and that intermediate of what these things understand. But it's really hard to just go through and sort of say, well, what's the exportable function? What's not the exportable function? What should I be looking at? We can literally sit and talk about little contracts for the next month and still not cover everything, right? So I think it would be a great idea to maybe break this down into different series. And I will try to commit to come in at least, you know, once a month or whatever, um, if Crypto Batman would like to commit to that once a month. And maybe we really break down um, different parts of a contract instead of trying to sit there and say, well, you look for blacklist, look, look for possibles and stuff like that and different modifiers within the contract. I think it's very, very important. And, you know, this is great content for Blockstar as well, even though we have those courses over there, but it's also a, a great thing to maybe start this as an ongoing thing. So I think Crypto Batman is back now, but maybe really taking and breaking down maybe one or two functions every you know, month or so, or maybe every couple of weeks, breaking, taking two or three functions and breaking specific, specific those down cool. and then put them together in a broader series because literally we could sit and talk about the the coding and all the functions and what they do, yeah. all the different modifiers that are possible for literally the next month and not cover everything. But, yeah, 100%. But at, the same time, at, the, at the same time, when we're talking about exploits, we can have a like a, 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 a an exploit section, or, or, or we can have tons of them where we could actually sit here and write an exploit real term, real time, like and and teach you how and teach you the the idea behind an exploit. I think understanding the idea behind an exploit is more powerful than understanding the code. If you if you if you know what kind of thing is happening, then you can spot that pattern. You know what I mean. Um, and that pattern recognition is gonna it's gonna serve you a lot better than actually knowing what the code's fucking doing. Um, so yeah, if you see something that looks like this, that seems to act like this, start asking questions, and then go and see somebody that maybe does know a lot more about Solidity and say, "Oh, I've seen this. It looks like something that I, I learned about in this series. Is that what's happening? You know, mm -hmm. it, it gives you the it gives you, it gives you the, the the opportunity to ask a question by spotting a pattern rather than just going, "Oh fuck, that's it." I mean, people. We'll just go, oh, look, you're doing this, it's fun, when you don't know anything. But yeah, go and ask. So come to me, come to fucking David. We're not going to turn you away. No chance. No way, no how. And, oh, I uh, might. Yeah, I'm you... my buddy. I'm my... I turn totally away all the time. Ah, <laughs> on, David. No, I mean, I, I'm, I used to, I'm used to his rejection now, Batman. Look, like, you, you're, the one who, you're, the one, you're the one who helps me shut down scams nowadays. But David's too busy for me, man. He used, to be, he, used to be, he used to be tight with me, and now he doesn't even have the time of day for me, man. That's because you've been messing with Crypto Batman, and you're not tight anymore, so I had to move on, buddy. <laughs> <laughs>
but yeah, no, I like, I really like the idea of that, um, you know, breaking it down because this is something we want to keep doing. Like there was, a, there was a question that was asked by someone, uh, Jakob about how to tell if wallets are locked. Um, but for me, that's, that's, that's something that we can do in another session. We can, we can yeah, dive yeah, into yeah. the BSC scan and look through wallets and look through, you know, what's good to look for there because it's, it's a totally different thing to, to contracts in my opinion, because, we can break down the percentage of holders and things like that and, you know, how to look at what's been happening on BSC scan. So we'll save that for another session. Um, at the same time, at the same time, um, we can get PM, who's the accountant, like the, he's, a, he's a certified CPA, and he can yeah. come and tell you the, the financial ramifications of mints and firms and everything else and explain just how that goes about and also LP. So there's lots of things we can do in this series that, 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 that will really, really benefit the, you know, the layman and the listener and educate people into what they should be looking at, what they should be looking for, and what um, what what implications that has in the entire um, in the entire space. So, like that would be quite powerful as well. I'm pretty sure I could I, I could get them signed up. So I think this series could be quite good. Yeah, let's yep. let's do it. Um, like I said, I can't commit to weekly or anything, Toby, but every two weeks, every thirty days, I can commit to that. You'll commit to what I tell you to, David. You will. You're lucky this is recorded. I will hold back you've gone, later. You've gone, from, you've, gone from, you've gone from do your own research to do your feckin' told. <laughs> I mean, if he's allowed to cuss on this theory, I'm finna let loose, man. I don't care if it's recorded at this point. If he's I, said, to... I said feckin'. I said, I said feckin'. I said feckin'. I did not. Feckin Listen, I, 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 it's, I think three or three or four or five maybe AMAs now. Batman's appeared in the background, and YouTube algorithm has already picked up that when he's on, um, parental advisory tag gets put on our videos. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think um, I think effectively what we can take away from this whole session is that if you don't know your, your stuff, if you don't know about coding and stuff. You need to know that the team behind the project know what they're doing, and you need to know that who the developer is within the team. Because there's so many times that we do OMAs where where we'll ask, "So who is part of the team? Who is your developer?" And I think we've slipped up on that question more recently because, well, I think more because people are using more trusted sources especially with the projects that we do AMAs with and stuff. But I think that's a, a question that we need to be asking a, a lot more regularly now. And who is your developer and how much do you trust them? How much control do they have? Um, 100%. You know. we, we have asked it a couple of times. In fact, we did ask yeah. it. You know, it, it, but it's, it's something people would fail to mention a lot of the time as well. Like, who's on your team? And they don't even mention the contract developer. No. And then it's yeah, like... I do try as much as I do to access it during a um, yeah, I think there was a few... Um, we had a few incidents where obviously the contracts went wrong and stuff and we hammered the point thereafter of who, you know, who is your developer and stuff so that you can... People have, uh, you know, more security with knowing who it is. But, you know, f for, from an expert's point of view, David and Batman... If so, so, for somebody's in, in our chats, uh, put down, uh, added in a contract and said, "Can you have a look through this?" Obviously, from 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 our point of view, uh, or any of us that don't know anything about coding and stuff, it's gonna you you go on these read and write contracts and you see nine hundred lines of code and stuff. Don't know where to begin. For somebody like you guys, like how easy would it be? How quick would it be to be able to uh, you know spot some of these exploits? Yeah, um, generally, uh, I, I, Tom, Tom will be able to tell you. I mean, I, I generally he he, he we're we'll having an AMA and he says, right, we've got the AMA. I say they, they haven't got a contract yet, or they do have a contract, and they did have a contract. So I went into their contract when nobody else knew the contract address except for myself and Tomster. And I think I I I texted you within thirty seconds, didn't I? With about seven yeah. different exploitable things. Yeah, so it's it's very very fast, very very fast. Yeah, Toby and I have had those same conversations. I think even uh, Mark and myself, usually if I send something, I can just glance through it and everything because I know exactly what I'm looking at when I read it compared to somebody that has no idea what any of it means, right? So is, once you've done it long enough and you're writing contracts and that's kind of what you're, you're living in and that's how you built your reputation, it's really easy to go through when you know what you're looking for. 
Um, just for the everyday person, they would could spend hours and still not understand it. But it's really quick when you do it every day. It's just super, super quick. So, you know, a couple minutes to look over a contract briefly. Now, if I find something that I need to look into, it may take a little longer than that. But I can generally spot them fairly quickly, just as that man said. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we, we had a complicated one um, uh, in the fact that their, their, their function was a little strange, but they, they had the ability to take tokens from people's wallets and put it in their own wallet and sell it, if Batman remembers uh, that one. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. It, what, what they were, yeah what, what they were doing was they, were, they, could, they could airdrop from anyone else's wallet to their own or to anyone else's. It was it was horrendous, absolutely horrendous. It wasn't yeah, from so, message sender. It was just you just provided an address. It was fucking disgusting. So pe- people would notice that their their tokens were going down or disappearing altogether, like out of their wallet, and like, what's going on? Like, is my wallet compromised? But it's not. It was just that contract taking their tokens from their wallet, giving it back to the owner who was selling it. Which, yeah. Well, uh, what's, <laughs> what's wrong? What's wrong with that? That's not how it's supposed to work. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I thought that's how it's supposed to work. Maybe sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, there's a term for it. It's called reverse buying. <laughs> um, um, so, so, yeah, Jakob in the chat has asked about, about uh, Solidity versions and the difference between older ones. So, for example, uh, version zero point eight point one seven versus 6.17 um, and if you are running an older one is can that be vulnerable and can you update it to a newer version or does it have to be completely redone right so so basically um, every iteration of, of the solidity compiler version will have bug fixes and they will be spotting zero day exploits and exploitable code that, that other people can use it can also be gas uh, gas um, gas efficiency things so there's 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 definitely a proponent for using the latest version but once you have a contract like we said before it's completely immutable once it's compiled and like uh, deployed to the blockchain it cannot be changed you cannot you cannot then go and update the bytecode it, it's yeah so basically you're looking for you know the, the, the highest version of solidity you can um, and just because it's compiled with the highest version doesn't mean that it's completely safe Right, um, and it also doesn't mean that it uses all of the new features of that compiler, like absolutely not. Um, so the, the the compiler version is is for the dev, um, but the the code within that is is definitely the most important thing because there is safe there's safe contracts in version four, the safe ver- contracts all the way up to version eight. It's just um, if they use the code that's been improved, um, then the, there could be improvements and there's less chance of any exploits. That's all it is. But once it's on the blockchain, it's immutable. It cannot be changed without, like we said, there's, there's a whole mechanism behind transparent upgradables and all this shit. But um, yeah, if, if you can see the code, the code can change. Cool. Okay. I, I think you... more to Jakob, just more to Jakob's point and everything. It, it's like bring out a new version of an app. It, it gets better and better and better, and you do have more abilities as the different compiler versions come out but like batman uh said it, it's more to do it to gas functions so like that making it better making it safer the way that it works with those nightly builds and everything so yeah. just like you said it's immutable as well but um I, I think we should literally save the the proxy and all that and verifiables and everything for a whole nother chat and everything but there are ways yeah. to keep your contract up to date and everything so that it does not have the vulnerabilities as easily. I mean, there's always a smart guy out there that's working on the next one, right? But being able to change up things, but I think we should definitely say that for later in the series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, listen, go. we're going to do one more thing before we go, but we'll definitely have more of these, so um, keep your eyes peeled and um, get ready for uh, the next one. Um, just look out for the announcements and sign up to the um, announcement channel. But yeah, firstly, like uh, Batman and David here, thanks for Thanks for coming along and doing this. Uh, I hope everyone's got something from it. Um, before we before we finish off, though, we'll just show you one more thing with our contract and how we go into it and how we do it. So this is our NFT contract. So um, if anybody hasn't replied yet, you can just reply to that comment that's pinned, and I'll put you into a quick duck race. And then whoever wins can quickly DM me their wallet, and we'll mint a um, we'll mint an NFT to their wallet via BSC scan. Toby, I'm gonna step away. 
I might step away for two minutes yeah. here. I've seen I've seen enough of your NFT contract. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem, brother. I'll see you soon, man. Um, right, okay, guys. It looks like that's about it. So let's get this quick dot race done. Uh, five seconds. Let's go. You see my screen, yeah? Yep, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll stop. Sh- I'll stop sharing. Okay, the winner is Arto. Congratulations, oh, mate. Just wow. quickly. D- Congratulations. Did you DM me your wallet? Is he in the VC? Um, let's have a look. If he's not in the VC, then we'll go on to the next one. I don't see him. Nope. I don't see. Okay, let's do another one then. Unlucky Otto, you could have just lost five thousand dollars then. Could have <laughs> been eight thousand actually. Tree Fiddy. Tree Fiddy in the VC. Yes, sir. Yeah, cool man. Cool. Just uh, DM me your wallet, brother, and we'll mint an NFT to your wallet. Right, guys, so obviously you've got BSC scan here. Yeah, I think that's our contract. So just copy and paste the contract in, and it is the LCL Paul Jake contract. There we go. All right. So we also got the buy button up, uh, the, the NFT buy button in the chat now. So hopefully it'll pop up in the chat. Oh, yeah. Nice. Is that set up? Yeah. Yeah, it should be set up, hopefully. All right. So for me, because I'm the owner of this contract, it's just the simple case of connecting my MetaMask. So we go into the right contract and then connect to web free and I connect the owner wallet. So I've got multiple wallets, obviously, but this one is the owner of the contract. And then you've got all the different functions here that I can use in the contract. Uh, so in this case, we are going to mint one, two. So this, all this function does is basically mint an NFT to whatever wallet I put in here. So we'll put Tree Fiddy's wallet in here and we click right. We get a MetaMask confirmation. All right, I'm confirm. Back. Just wait for the confirmation. Who wrote that shit ass contract? Jesus. <laughs> and there we go. Just like that, we've minted an NFT to Tree Fiddy's wallet. So there you go. It's just popped up in the chat. That's the NFT he's got. Unfortunately, it isn't, but it's still a for the job and ongoing airdrops. So keep hold of it, Tree Fiddy. Toby, I just so got a go, question. Guys. Does that make you a de- Toby, does that, that make that you a developer now? That, me, a... that makes me <laughs> a full stack dev, mate. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, guys, that that's just can how you, you, you do one you, function. Can you please click view your transaction so you're not doxing Tree Fiddy's wallet anymore? Uh, sorry, buddy. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> Fucking hell. So read contract is uh, another thing that you could do. So I, for, for example, if I wanted to check the owner of a p- specific NFT, I could put 256 in here. So let's say I want to see who owns 256. Query it. And then that's going to tell me. That's going to be me, that buddy. NFT. That's going to be me. I can tell you who it is. You can dodge me. I don't care. <laughs> but yeah, so you, there we go, guys. You're gonna put a, to be fair. You could have put most any number in the front part of that, and it probably would have showed me, buddy. <laughs> Literally. Um, but yeah, I, I hope you've um, I hope you've enjoyed the, the session today, guys. And um, we'll definitely be doing more of these, depending on the availability of our top knowledge devs in here. Um, but otherwise, we can do a session on BSC scan because. There's a fair bit of that I understand and I can help people with. And remember, guys, this trans this 
I was just going to say, this translates over to EtherScan as well. So if you guys, well, I don't use BSC Scan. This all translates over what we're talking about to EtherScan as well, if you're wanting to go through and look at contracts. I think um, a, a, a section on DexGuru would be handy as well. DexGuru is the most powerful thing in this space. Like, it tells you. DexGuru. Yeah. yeah. It's we spectacular. Can do that. Absolutely spectacular. I'm a wizard. I'm a wizard by that thing. Yeah, I, I think a good thing for the next series would maybe go over to like different types of contracts, like abstract construct and how they're developed and everything as well. I think that's very important because yeah. I see a lot of contracts that are developed and they're done in, in different series and everything going down and everything. I always recommend and try to stay away from that type of development and do everything throughout one contract. But I think it's very important that way when people see all these different modifiers and everything, but they're in separate contracts yeah. that are attached. Yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah. really important. It's the whole inheritance concept in it. It's, it's object oriented right. programming. It's it's inheritance and it's it's a fucking nightmare. It can get so complex very quickly. I think yeah. I think what we'll do then is try and structure it a bit a bit more. This has given us like a really good overview of, uh, of from like your point of view and and what we can look out for and stuff. And then we'll try and structure it going forwards to to pull together like a, a full series so you can get from you know A to B to C. And uh, have you know try and get a lot more knowledge around each of these areas to give you a, a good good picture of how to spot scams and what you know what, what to look out for and stuff. This is like the preview of what you guys can expect in the future, and then we'll have it broken down into a series. So this is just kind of a, a general overview and kind of a sneak peek of what the series will be about. Awesome, exactly. Yeah, listen, thanks again, guys, for uh, taking the time out to do this with us. And uh, thanks for everyone who joined in and, and listened along. Um, I hope you, hope you found it valuable. And every day's a learning day in crypto. <laughs> every day. Every day's a school day, indeed. It sure is. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. Really appreciate you uh, taking out your time, giving us some free lessons there. That's uh, really good of you, Batman and David Hunter. And we'll uh, see you all at the next one.